Hello, welcome to part five in our series of lectures on how to observe the sun at local apparent noon for a position fix. I'm still Commander Chris Kreitlein and I'm still presenting these lectures to you. Um, I hope you're uh, understanding everything. I hope you have the concepts in your mind. It's important that you understand everything very clearly before we move on. We're now right in the middle of working a fix. If you've got any doubts at all, please go back and review an earlier part and, and then catch up here again. Okay, so like I said, we're in the middle of working a fix, so let's dive back in and see if we can work it out. Okay, here we are at part five, and today we are going to learn how to figure longitude as part of our observation and sight reduction process for shooting the sun at local apparent noon. We did latitude in the last section, part four, so if you've got any questions about that, please go back and review it. Okay, let's jump into longitude. Now, this would be step five in our process. What we're going to do is dial in a previous sextant height. Now, at this point, we've We've already observed the sun at its peak at local apparent noon. Now we're going to go back in our readings, pick one, and dial it in. I'll show you graphically what I mean by that in a second. We're going to continue our observations of the sun until it descends to the point that it matches that previous sextant height. And then we'll record that in UT. Okay, let's take a look at what I mean. All right, here is the list of sextant readings that I got on my observations of the sun. We shot uh, the sun at local apparent noon right here at 1735.58 at an HS of 80 degrees, 19.4 minutes. We use that to figure our latitude. Now, we're going to actually use these next two to figure our longitude. Why? Because we're going to get the exact moment of local apparent noon. Here we got the sextant height. Now, maybe it was this time, maybe we were off a little bit. It's important that we get as close as we can. So we're going to use an alternate method to refine this time. Maybe we actually missed it by a few seconds, maybe even a minute or two. So let's work on coming up with the exact moment of local apparent noon. So what we do is we go back down here. We could, we could pick any of these, but I picked this one. It's 1729.46. This was the time, and our HS was 80 degrees, 11.4 minutes. We dial that back into the sextant, and we continue our observations until the lower limb of the sun sits on the horizon at that exact HS. Then we note the time. So here I've done it. The sun touched the horizon again on its way down. You know, it's descending. It's already peaked and it's going down. It touched the horizon at 80, 11.4 at 17, 43 minutes and 20 seconds. So we've got these two times. These are what we want. The, the, this HS is, is really irrelevant other than allowing us to get these two times and I'll show you what we do with that. Okay, this is the section of the form that we're going to use to figure the exact moment of local apparent noon in universal time. Once again, we're not, we've already figured out the HS, the sextant height. Now we're wanting the exact second of local apparent noon. What we do is, this is that form we put the universal time of our last sextant height. Remember, it was 1743.20. Then we put our first one, and we subtract one from the other. This gives us a difference of 1334. 1334. Okay? We want to take that 1334, disregard that 17. Okay, we're not ready for that yet. Uh, but take this 1334 divided in half, and that gives us 6 minutes and 47 seconds. That's this difference divided by 2. We're going to add that then to the first HS, as it says here. And that gives us 
36.23. We bring our 17 in again, and that gives us at the exact moment of local apparent noon of 17.36.23. Okay, review that if you didn't quite follow it, but I think you probably did. We're just dividing that distance in half and re-adding it to our first sextant height. Okay, then we come to the section of the form where we figure longitude and we write that time of local apparent noon right here. Okay, so here we go. We write our time of local apparent noon. Now we know local apparent noon at the prime meridian was at what time? Do you remember? Well, of course, it was at exactly 12 o'clock. We want to know the difference between local apparent noon at the prime meridian and our local apparent noon so we can get that transit, that transit time of the sun. All right, so we just subtract that. That gives us 5 hours, 36 minutes, and 23 seconds. Now, you recall... I think it was in part three or early in part four, we talked about the equation of time. This is where we have to add that correction, the equation of time. We add the equation of time, which is adding three minutes and 29 seconds. In some cases, you subtract it. In this case, we add three minutes and 29 seconds. Well, your obvious question is, hey, where did you get that? Okay, I got that out of the nautical almanac on the appropriate page. We're working on uh, the 20th, so we go to that same page we've been using, and in the lower right corner, we have here Sun Equation of Time. We just go down here and look on the 20th. Remember, we were in May the 20th, so this is the, the May 20th page. Here's the 20th. And here's the equation of time. We don't care for midnight, zero, zero. We want 12 o'clock. And here it says three minutes and 29 seconds. Because it's not shaded, we know we add it. If this was shaded in gray, then that would mean subtract. But it's not shaded. Remember this point, it's not shaded, so we add it to our calculations. 3 minutes and 29 seconds. That is the correction we have to add for the Earth's orbit and rotation as well as precession. I don't want to bore you with all those details, but there's a, a couple things that go into this. Okay, I explained a, one of them earlier. Okay, so anyway, we'll take this 3 minutes and 29 seconds and add it. We will simply add it to... Uh, the difference that we got from noon at the prime meridian to our noon, okay, and that gives us 5 hours, 39 minutes, and 52 seconds. That's how far the sun had to travel from the prime meridian to our position. Again, we're going to go into Table 3 in the Nautical Almanac. That is our Arc to Time page, and we're going to pull out the longitude associated with that. Here's the page. Here's the hours, 5 minutes, 36 seconds, I'm sorry, 5 hours, 36 minutes, and that gives us 84 degrees. 84 degrees, it says here. We take the remainder, 3 minutes and 52 seconds over here in these columns, and that gives us 58 minutes of longitude. When you get a nautical almanac, sit and study this table so that you understand exactly how you have to go in here and extract these, these numbers. I'm, I'm going very quickly now. It's easy to understand. When you get your own copy, take a few minutes and study this. Okay, we bring that back. 8458. That is what we're saying is our longitude. What we want to do now, of course, is to compare our calculations from our observation with our DR position. And we see that it's very close. Uh, it's only uh, two minutes off, which corresponds approximately to two miles. So that is very good. Once again, I have to confess, uh, I'm generally not that close. And it's hard to get very close with this method, unfortunately. Okay, well, that pretty much... Uh, completes our exercise here. 
of uh, working up our observation and converting it, reducing it into a latitude longitude position. However, I want to go over with you some considerations. Uh, this methodology, using the sun at local apparent noon, generally gives a pretty accurate latitude. Again, the sun has to be on your meridian, either directly north or south. Um, but it's generally not very good for giving longitude. In fact, within 20 miles is considered uh, pretty good. Um, that's why this method is not really used uh, by professional navigators, because it's hard to get a good longitude. One of the reasons is because the sun appears to hesitate at the top of its arc. It's just a natural consequence of, of rising in the sky, skimming across the top, and then starting to descend again. For several minutes, the sun will appear to just hesitate at the top of its arc across the sky. So for those reasons and others, it's, it's hard to get a good longitude. Latitude will be pretty good. Longitude won't necessarily be that good. Of course, another shortcoming of this methodology is that uh, you're counting on seeing the sun at local apparent noon. Well, what if the sun is obscured and you can't use it? What if uh, the sea state is so bad you can't get a good horizon for one reason or the other? Well, if this is the only method you know, then you will not be able to make an observation. You can use the moon if it's up and it happens to be visible and the horizon happens to be visible. You can use this same technique for that or a bright star um, or one of, the, one of the planets. But once again, that, is, that would be so extremely rare as, as to be essentially uh, not really reasonable to expect. So you're pretty much consigned to using the sun, and if it's not available at noon, well, you're out of luck. That's why professional navigators generally use uh, a different methodology. Well, let's talk a little bit about using this technique. How would you? Well, what is the morning routine for a navigator? Generally, what a navigator does is he shoots the sun at about nine o'clock in the morning. Now he cannot use this method, you know, the sun at local apparent noon. But what he will use is the intercept method using an assumed position. Using that method, he'll shoot the sun at about nine o'clock. Then he'll advance that line of position. He'll advance it along his track, along his dead reckoning track. And then he'll observe the sun at local apparent noon, provided that it's visible and the horizon is visible and he'll use that latitude longitude and cross it with his line of position from his earlier observation to develop what we call a running fix and then he'll advance that running fix uh, for the rest of the day on his course and speed as he would a regular dead reckoning track so that's generally what people do um, it gives you uh, a pretty good fix and uh, substantiates your DR track, generally speaking. Now, like I said, if, if you're really interested in celestial navigation, you want to do it right, you want to learn the, the techniques that the professionals use, you're going to have to learn the sight reduction method uh, called the intercept method using an assumed position. You use the sun, the moon, four planets, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn, or any of the 57 navigable stars. You'll use whichever of those are visible at twilight, civil twilight in the morning or civil twilight in the evening. Uh, it, using those, it's entirely independent of a meridian, but your horizon must be visible. Uh, so uh, there are you know, techniques for doing that. Uh, any time of day, of course, you can use the sun and moon with this method. Uh, not necessarily at local apparent noon. You can do it any time of day that those two bodies are visible. Or Venus, as soon as Venus is visible in the evening, you don't necessarily have to wait for uh, civil twilight. As soon as you can see Venus, either in the morning or in the evening, you can use Venus. Um, so, 
this technique is much more flexible and for that reason um, it's used by navigators and if you do it right it gives you a very accurate fix uh, much more so than the sun at local apparent noon actually all right uh, I teach both of these methods the um, sun at local apparent noon as well as um, the um, intercept method using an assumed position in my book Simple Celestial. It's available by going to the website globazon.com and uh, downloading the order form, sending me a check and I'll rush this book to you. Uh, I've written it as clearly as I possibly could to make it understandable for anyone. Uh, so I, I think with this book uh, you'll be able to learn both of these methods uh, rather quickly, be able to put them into practice. Well, that pretty much concludes this series of lectures on shooting the sun at local apparent noon. If you go through these and you have questions, I certainly welcome you, them. I welcome you to email me at sales at uh, I check this email and uh, any questions for me, I'm very quick to respond. So, uh, as you go through this, if, if there's something you don't uh, understand or something you disagree with, something I need to clarify, uh, don't hesitate to uh, send me a question or comment. I'd certainly enjoy hearing from you. So, thanks for uh, paying attention and uh, fair winds and following seas and keep it safe out there.